to Fresh Wind Worship. We invite you today to be a full participant in song, as we say these lyrics, as we open ourselves to hear from the Word of God today. But most importantly, may we be full participants in our hearts as we come before a holy God, that even though we are unholy and impure, He still receives us just as we are, with the promise that if we let Him, He can change us, transform us, lead us into life everlasting. We praise the name of his son Jesus, Lord and Savior. So let's begin. to our time of worship this morning. So glad that you've joined us. Uh, we hope that our time together will be profitable and that you'll just uh, feel like you're being drawn closer to the Lord as we spend time together worshiping. Uh, the Bible tells us that pleasing offerings to God are lips that give thanks and praise. And we started out by singing, praise the name of Jesus. And so lips that give thanks and praise to him are an acceptable offering to him. Also, he says, doing good is a great way to offer up a, th a thank you note to, to Jesus for all that he's done for us. So I trust that as we spend time together, God would stir in our hearts that we would rejoice in what he's done, that we would be people who give thanks and then we'd be quick to go out and work and do the good works that he's already prepared for us to do this week. And we're so thankful that you support us and uh, the many ways that you show your gratitude to us uh, here at the Western Home. Uh, we love to hear from you, and if uh, you have any needs that we could help with, please reach out. Uh, one of the best ways to reach us is at our email address. That's freshwind at westernhome.org. Um, again, freshwind at westernhome.org. Also, we appreciate your support for the ministry. I know many of you have been so faithful uh, to give uh, for the financial needs of the ministry here and for the Alice Eisenhower Fund. 
uh, so grateful for your ongoing support. And if you'd like to continue to support us or you'd like to send us a piece of mail, uh, you could send that to 5307 Caraway Lane here in Cedar Falls. And so again, we're just so great, grateful for your partnership in the ministry here. And as we gather for worship, we certainly want to be uh, praying and we want to pray for our world and just kind of some of the struggles and troubles that we see there. So let's just bow together this morning and invite God into all that we're doing. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity we have to know you and to serve you and help us to be faithful as we offer up those pleasing sacrifices to you. Help us to have lips that are quick to give thanks and praise to you for all that you've done for us. And God, help us to be faithful as we accomplish the work that you prepared for us to do, that we might make a good difference in the world that we live in. So guide and direct our steps this week. Help us to be faithful as we listen for your voice and as we follow. And Father, we think about our world and we especially think about the trouble there in Ukraine and God, all those who are struggling today, we just wanna pray that you would draw into that situation. God, that you would work out your perfect will, that you would put, put away the forces of evil and God, that you would just, um, just step into to the troubles in the world that we have. And God, we're thankful that you're sovereign, that you're at work, that you're always drawing people to yourself. So I pray this morning that as we look into your word, that you do just that, that you would draw us in, that you would teach us what you have for us, and that you'd help us to be faithful and obedient as we go about our day. We just ask your blessing now in our time. In the name of Jesus, amen. Oh, that we would indeed taste and see that God is good and that his grace is indeed sufficient. He giveth more grace when the burden grows greater and sendeth more strength when the labors increase to added affliction, he addeth his mercy to multiply trials, his multiplied peace. His love has no limit, his grace has no measure, his power is no boundary. to draw your attention back to Revelation chapter 3. We've been spending some time there looking at the messages to the seven churches there in Asia. I remember Jesus gave a message to John as he was exiled there on the Isle of Patmos, and he sent those to the individual believers there in the different cities, and it was a message to kind of guide them as a church. Uh, most of the messages had a, a way that Jesus commended them for the good things that they were doing. Uh, but then most of them also had a warning to them. There was something that needed to change, something that needed to be different if they were going to be faithful to him and be fruitful in the work that he called them to do. And as I've thought about these churches, I kind of thought about it like a, a physician. You know, if we go to our doctor for a physical, we go in there and he does all kinds of testing and he monitors us, he evaluates us, 
And then usually we have to come back for a follow-up visit, you know, as he's done the blood work and as, he, as he's checked us over, we come back and then he sits down with us and he kind of goes over how we're doing. You know, and it, he goes over and most of the time we want to hear, or well, we want to hear good news that, you know, your heart's strong, uh, your lungs are working well, your body seems to function the way it's supposed to, your mind's sharp, all those kind of things that he tests for. And so we love it when he comes back with a good report. But sometimes then we hear the words, after he gives us the good news, we hear the bad news. You know what, there's a few areas that we're gonna to have to work on. You know, the test results show that there's a problem that we need to address. And usually when he turns the corner from the good news to the bad news, we kind of just turn off the good news. You know, we're more focused on what do we need to do to be healthy? What do we need to do to get a good uh, bill of health? And so that's kind of how I see these letters working out. Uh, to the churches there in Asia. And most of them came back with some work that needed to be done. Now, the church today is a great encouraging message because this church didn't have any uh, words of warning, uh, any words of condemnation. He just came back and says, hey, you're doing well. Just keep on doing what you're doing. You're healthy. You're thriving. Uh, keep on keeping on. And so the church in Philadelphia, uh, that was the faithful church. And what characterized this church was their brotherly love, a healthy, loving, and fruitful group of believers. That's what characterized them. And, and some commentators believe that they're the um, awakened saints of the last days. The, the, this is the church that's faithful and thriving when Jesus comes back. And that's where we want to be today. We want to be Christians that have a good bill of health. As Jesus looks over our lives, our hearts and our minds and our motives in the works that we do, he, we want him to say, you're doing great. Just keep on doing what you're doing and be faithful to the end. And that was the church at Philadelphia. It was a good report from the divine physician. And so let's look what he says here in verse seven as we begin. A description of the one who's uh, addressing this church at Philadelphia. Of course, that's the risen Jesus. In Revelation 3, verse 7, we read this. It says, The angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, and who shuts and no one opens, says this to the church. And so, like the other letters, we have a description of Jesus. We have the one who comes and does the evaluating of the believers there. He assesses them, he evaluates them, and then he goes on to give them the, the results, the message that he wants for them to hear and live by. So what is it about Jesus that he points out here? Well, first thing we see is that he's holy. That means that his character is perfect and genuine. He is always right and his motives are always good. So Jesus is um, perfect through and through. His motives are always right. They're always best. You know, there's never any hidden agenda. Jesus is set apart from us. He's holy and he's true. The second thing we see here is that he's true. It says here that he speaks of his righteous actions which come from his holy character. He always does what is right and he always does what is true. So in other words, his actions, the way he works, flows from his holy character. And so the fact that his motives are always right and he's genuine through and through, Jesus always does what's true and right. So we can trust that. And you know, sometimes I wonder, God, what are you up to in my life? And maybe today you're wondering that very thing. Where are you leading? What are you doing? But the fact that he's true in all that he does means that where he's leading us is exactly where we need to go. And so we see he's holy. We see he's true. And then the third thing we see here is he holds the key of David. And that speaks of his sovereignty and his authority. He is the rightful ruler over all things. And if you're familiar with David in the Old Testament, David was the king that God uh, raised up to watch over his people and to rule over his people. He was told over and over again that through his line, through his descendants, would come one that would sit on the Davidic throne. And of course, that's the Messiah, Jesus. That's the Savior who came to rule over us. And the Bible talks about the fact that God wants to reign over his people. He wants to rule as the sovereign. In fact, in uh, Psalm 103, verse 9, it says this. 
Uh, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. So again, a reminder that God is watching over all the affairs of the world. He's watching over all the affairs of our lives. And because he's true and genuine and faithful and right and perfect and holy, we can trust him uh, to guide all that he does in our lives. So um, he describes himself in that way. And then he talks about the fact that he opens and closes doors. He says, the doors that are shut, nobody can open. And the doors that I open, nobody can shut. And in our lives, the first door that he opens is the door to salvation. And, and you know, over in John 10, uh, Jesus said this. He said, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. And so Jesus is the door to salvation. And in Revelation 1, he talks about the one that he's the risen one. He's the one that's conquered death. And look, look back there in Revelation 1, verse 17. It says this. It says, do not be afraid, Jesus said. I am the first and the last. I'm the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades, or hell. And so again, Jesus is the one who overcame the grave. He's the one that defeated sin and death and the enemy. And he holds the key. Uh, he opens the door for us uh, to enter into that forgiven relationship with him and to live with him forever. He's the one that holds the keys to death and hell. And he opens and closes doors, especially for salvation. That's where it first begins. The second door that he opens is the door for ministry. Not only are we saved, but he's got work for us to do. Uh, look, look with me at Revelation 3, verse 8. He says, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door, which no one can shut. Because you have little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. And so Jesus opens up doors for us for ministry. And don't you love when he does that? You love when he works and he guides and he puts you in the right place at the right time with just the right message for the people that he calls you to serve. And he's done that throughout history. I really love reading through the book of Acts, you know, where Peter and Paul began to, to go out and they began to minister in different cities and different regions. One of my favorite stories is in Acts 16, where Paul and Silas went there to Macedonia and they were called there and how God just kind of guided and directed their path to get them right where uh, they needed to be. Uh, look again at Acts 16 with me. In verse 6, it says, They passed through Phryg the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. In passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him, and he's saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And as they met this group of women out in the city square worshiping, look at what happened. It says a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And so we see here that Paul, Paul uh, God just opened up the ministry for him to go exactly where God wanted him to speak the message that he gave him to the people that he called him to minister to. And how God just opened up the heart of Lydia as she heard the truth of the gospel and she became a believer in Jesus. And God does that for us as well. And so I pray that, that, that you and I would be open to God's leading that we let the Spirit of God open and close the doors in our lives. And I know sometimes when he closes the door, sometimes that can be frustrating. It could cause us to question, God, what are you up to in my life? And yet, he's the God who opens and closes the doors for the best and the fruitful, most fruitful ministry in our lives. So what was it in Philadelphia that characterized these believers? I call them open-door believers. Well, I think there's three things that characterize our lives that really should characterize our lives as well if we're going to be used most effectively for God and his plan. The first thing that we see here that characterizes an open-door Christian is this. They had little power. In other words, they were humble. They were dependent. They were surrendered and obedient to him. 
They were, they were living their lives in the proper place. It was a place of dependence. You know what? That's where he wants you and I at this morning. He wants us to be humble. He wants us to surrender our will to his. He wants us to be willing to follow him wherever he might lead as the commander and the chief of our lives. Are you willing to do that? Are you humbling yourself under his hand? Are you allowing him to lead you where he wants you to go? You know, the Peter, Peter said this to his followers in 1 Peter chapter 5. He said this, All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. So we're living in the proper place. We're living in a place of dependence. That's where he wants you and I to live. And when we do that, He'll bless our efforts. He'll open the right door. He'll close the wrong door. He'll guide us to where he wants us to be most fruitful and effective for him. So the first thing we see is they, were, um, little power, they had little power. They were humble. The second thing that we see here for open door Christians is this. They kept his word. They were faithful and obedient to the word of God. They were living by the proper message. In other words, they had ears that were open to what the word of God was saying to them and they stepped into that and they were obedient. And when we're doers of the word, the Bible says it will be blessed in all that we do. These people, as open to our Christians, longed for the word of God. And yet we live in a world where sometimes the word of God is just kind of set on the shelf. You know, it's just kind of an old dusty book that we need to pull out to go to church. You know, it has a message that's good and profitable, but it's not really any different than any other book on our bookshelf. In fact, one of the books that I read this week said this about the pushback that we get on the word of God. Satan corrupts the word. The critics subtract from the word. Some large sections of organized Christendom add to the word. The modernist or liberals supplant the word with their own ideas. And much of Protestantism neglects the word and the world simply rejects the word. But the true child of God, on the other hand, loves it. He meditates on it, all of it. He reads it and desires it and studies it, treasures it, obeys it, and even defends it if necessary. He said this is the true group of believers, as it describes the believers there at Philippi. And so the, the church that, that longs to be most effective is the people that has a longing for the word of God. They live under the proper message. And then the third thing that we see that characterizes them is this. Open door believers do not deny Jesus' name. And so they affirm Jesus as Savior and Lord. They lived under the right authority, under the proper authority in their lives. And so we see that they were willing to uh, bow their knee to Jesus. And you know, the Bible says that there's no other name under heaven but the name of Jesus by which we must be saved. And so that's where we begin. We bow our knee to him for salvation and then we bow our knee to him and surrender so that he can use us in whatever way he chooses. And so the open door Christians uh, follow after him. You know, the Bible tells us in Philippians 2 that someday every knee's gonna bow and every tongue's gonna confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so I hope today that you're bending your knee, that you're bowing your will in surrender to the true authority of our lives. And that, of course, is Jesus, the name of Jesus. And so these were open door believers that God was opening up a way for them to be most fruitful and effective. We see that as he goes on, that because they were fruitful, because they were believers that loved God and had this brotherly love for, for other people and for other believers, that God was using them and their ministry was effective. In fact, Philadelphia was a city that was a main thoroughfare. And people went through Philadelphia to go out into the other cities and the other regions in that area. And so God was using Philadelphia in a strategic way. And you know what? He was using those believers in a strategic way as well as a main thoroughfare by which his grace could flow to those around them. They were being faithful. 
They were humble. They were dependent on his word, and they were surrendering to the authority of Jesus. And God was opening up great doors of opportunity for them to be blessed and to be used. But you know what? Because of that, the enemy was also at work. Wherever God's program is advancing, the enemy is also as, at work as well. And so he goes on here in the next verse, and he says, but God is going to defeat the enemy. Look at what he says here in verse 9. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but they lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. So in this, in this area, there was imposters. They said they were true followers, but in fact, they weren't. And he calls them those who come from the synagogue of Satan. In other words, those that oppose uh, the teaching of Jesus, the teaching of his word. And so they were imposters, just like we have imposters in our world today. They deny the truthfulness of God's word. They deny that it's inspired or authoritative. They think Jesus was just a good teacher or a prophet, but he wasn't, certainly wasn't the son of God. They don't believe in heaven or hell. They don't believe in the need to repent. And so even in our day and age, like their day and age, there's imposters. And yet Jesus said, at the end, uh, the true followers are gonna be set apart uh, from those who, who aren't following Jesus in a true and genuine way. And the enemy is going to be defeated, and that's the good news. Later on in Revelation, we see that the enemy is completely and, and uh, uh, definitely uh, defeated. And so notice how he concludes this in verse 10 and following. He says, Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing that that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly, so hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. In the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God in my new name. So he tells these believers, he encourages us today, hold fast to what you have. Be faithful. The divine doctor is saying, you're doing great. Just keep doing what you're doing. You're healthy. You're strong. Keep serving as I call you to serve. And that's what he says here. And I love in verse 10 where it says, you know, there's an hour of testing that's going to come on the whole or earth, but we're not going to have to go through that. We know that it's a tribulation period, and we're certainly moving in that direction. But the good news is it says he doesn't just help us through it, but yet he'll take us from it. He'll take us out of it. We know that as the rapture of God's people. And so he says, be encouraged. You'll keep on doing what you're doing. You're healthy. Just keep following, keep trusting, and keep serving. And at the very end, then, he gives us this call again, like the, in the other letters. If you're hearing what I'm saying, then respond. In verse 13, he says this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So as the divine doctor makes his way through your life, what is, he find, what is he finding? What is he seeing as the test results come in? Are you strong? Are you healthy? Are you faithful? Are you obedient? Are you humble before him as you seek to do his will? That's what he wants for us today. That's the church in Philadelphia that he commends for being so faithful. So I trust today that that's where you are living, that that's where I'm living as we, as we seek to follow after the risen Jesus and listen to the message that he gives us today. So let's ask him to give us strength to be faithful all the way to the end. Father, we just thank you for the words that you gave to these, these folks living in Philadelphia. God, this church, these believers, God, you gave them a personal message and it was a message of affirmation. God, you affirmed them and commended them for being humble and dependent on you. And, and Father, you, you affirmed them for staying true to your word. I pray that today we would be believers who stayed true to your word, that we'd be obedient, that we'd be doers of the word and be blessed in what you've called us to do. And then finally, you commended them for lifting up and exalting the name of Jesus. And we certainly live in a world where uh, people want to challenge uh, the name of Jesus and who he is and what he came to accomplish. So help us to stand strong, help us to stand firm, and help us to just continue to feel your presence as we go out to serve you uh, in the world that we live. So God, thank you for calling us into a relationship with you. And uh, God, just use us in ways that only you can indeed get the credit. 
We pray in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. As we end our time together, we pray that this song, this hymn, might be the testimony of many of us watching, that love, God's love, has lifted us up into a place of holiness and redemption and restoration, and he gets all the glory. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. My despairing cry from the waters lifted me now safe am I oh love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me and all heart I him I give ever to him I'll cling in his blessed presence live ever his praises sing love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best songs faithful loving service to to him Love.